The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television, bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and Friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now, to our studios in Boston. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another exciting adventure of As We See It. Welcome to show number 41, being recorded on Sunday, May 6th, 2012. From Boston, Massachusetts, I'm Ed Jupin. Also here in the Boston area, we have Larry the Lobster. Out in St. Louis, Missouri, we have Holly Hurley. And we have a special guest with us today. We'll tell you all about who he is a little later on. From Bergen County, New Jersey, Lawrence Ignacek. Gene and Fred are both off today off uh, wandering around the world somewhere, hopefully looking for good stories for next week. Hello, everybody. Well, hello. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, Iggy. I'm going to refer to Iggy as Iggy because we have two Larrys or two Lawrences, so we have the lobster and we have Iggy. So uh, welcome aboard, Iggy. Glad to have you here on As We See It this week. Feelings mutual. And uh, Holly, it's all yours. Uh, I guess you're in the driver's seat here today doing double duty this week between Crashing Glass and As We See It. So uh, take it away. Awesome. Well, uh, I am privileged to be in the driver's seat, although I don't know if that's any good for anybody else. But with that, I guess I'll turn it over to the lobster. My first lobster tail is a goldfish has a memory span of three seconds, but actually a goldfish can recall information for up to five months. Number two, a tiger has striped skin, not striped fur. Or not just striped fur. Or in addition to. And number three, cranberries get their name cranberry from craneberry because they grow on a stalk that looks like a crane's neck. Number four, the origin of the term bridal shower comes from English brides who used to buy bride ale for their wedding guests. So, okay, so a goldfish has a memory span of three seconds, but can actually recall information for up to five months. It's kind of like so, me. I can remember stuff from five months ago, but only about three seconds worth of it. Right. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> so if the cat stuck its paw into the goldfish's water, does the goldfish remember from the time the cat walked up to the bowl, up to the bowl, or after It probably finished? doesn't remember getting swatted in the head by the cat, but it remembers that it actually happened. <laughs> yeah, I, f I find that a really interesting phenomenon. Really also, that's got to be pretty miserable for a goldfish, because that's just five months of the same bowl going around and around and around. Same scenery. So after you've had a goldfish for five months, it no longer remembers the pet store. Right. And then as for the tiger skin, did someone shave a tiger to find this out? I mean, it had to have happened at some point, right? I imagine. That holds true with zebras as well, doesn't it? I think that they're uh, striped on their skin also. Lobster? Um, you know what he's going to tell you, Holly. Why do you ask him a question? <laughs> you know he doesn't research his own lobster tails. <laughs> well, it may or may not be true. <laughs> Iggy, what do you think? Do zebras also have striped skin? I believe so. I'm being, it's a serious question, not a joke. I think like tigers, their skin is striped. Well, they say that a leopard never changes its spots, so I guess oh, yeah, that there you would go. definitely so, uh, apply in this particular instance as well. Yeah, and very it's true about leopards too. It's part of their then, natural yeah. skin, so they can actually uh, adapt with their habitat as far as what they have to deal with, as far as the other animals they mingle with, as much as the actual weather that they deal with a lot of these obviously coming from the continent of africa they need to certainly be able to uh, survive and live year-round their actual natural skin is part of them adapting to their environment well that's a lot more information answer. we've ever gotten on a lobster tail thank you i found Iggy. the answer the san diego <laughs> zoo says that zebras actually have black skin underneath their hair ah okay so the skin is black even though the the fur is black and black white. and white Okay. Very interesting. Now, as for I, now, I I don't have much to say about cranberries, but I know that uh, this I know falls into Fred's who who cares category actually. Yeah, I, guess. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, you eat them, you don't eat them, you cook them, you don't cook them. I don't know. But the uh, but the term bridal shower, I think that's highly appropriate. I mean, you just give the bride a whole lot of a whole lot of booze. Either way you look at it, I think it's mm -hmm. evolved almost perfectly linearly. 
All right. Well, All right. Well, I guess that closes up another edition of Lobster Tales. Indeed, indeed. Close well, the I book guess we'll on move it. on here. Apparently, this is a really interesting story to me because it, of the weirdness of it all. A dentist apparently pulled out all of her ex-boyfriend's teeth after they broke up. And I'm sorry, has nobody seen Little Shop of Horrors? Do not go to your dentist if they were your ex. Just switch dentists. Dentists are bad enough to begin with. What's, like, what's the backstory behind this? Before I read into it, just from seeing the headline, I just assumed that maybe this guy had a lot of dental work done and his wife or girlfriend, whoever it was, had paid for it. And she said, well, we split up. I'm taking the teeth back because it's my money that I invested into your mouth. Um, that, that was my first impression. So what is the backstory? No, apparently um, this woman is Polish, and uh, and they had broken up, but he still had scheduled a dental surgery with her just days after they had broken up. And she basically said, you know, I tried to be professional and detach myself from my emotions, but when I saw him lying there, I just thought, what a bastard, and decided to take all his teeth out. That's a direct <laughs> quote. So she gave him a heavy dose of anesthetic, locked the door, and just took out all his teeth. Oh, man. And Kath the guy said when can he you, woke Can up, we say Kathy Bates? Yeah, right. This is totally misery style. And the guy said when he woke up and this that woke up rather, this is a direct quote. He said, I knew something was wrong because when I woke up I couldn't feel any teeth and my jaw was strapped with bandages. <laughs> and then to get him to go ahead and leave, she said, Don't worry, your mouth is just numb and you won't be able to feel anything for a while. I guess vengeance is mine, huh? I Indeed, because, really because, wow. because because that's he's now grief. toothless, his new girlfriend left him. Wow. Yep. I'm sorry. I just think that's his own foolishness. You don't go to your ex-girlfriend to put you under after you broke her up with her for another woman. That's just dumb. Yeah, so she, she got her vengeance on that one, that's for sure. Now, Iggy, do you drink a lot of uh, energy drinks? I used to until I read the article. <laughs> I, back in time, I have no idea. I don't know if I'm going to be buying any more. Actually, I have uh, protein shakes. But that wouldn't be classified as energy drinks. Well, before we, well, before you, yeah, before, before we, you tell us about uh, yeah, that, before go ahead we tell, and tell us about the article, Iggy. Because I was just going to say, I believe soda would probably fall into that same category. But oh yeah, we, but people could, have known about soda for years. Go ahead, Iggy. Yeah, go ahead go and ahead. tell us the story, and then we'll talk about. It. Yeah, this is interesting. Well, actually, my story revolves around vitamin water, and I don't know if you heard that there was a number of complaints that had come out about vitamin water as far as people saying that they were feeling nauseous from drinking vitamin water, which they would normally use to obviously replenish their water after they worked out. And the way that it came across to me when I read an article going back some time was the fact that there was a lot of sugar it was found after the fact when the investigator was actually sugar in the vitamin water that was causing a lot of people to feel nauseous. Well, so the, inter the interesting thing, Iggy, before we get in, before we get into that, I mean, obviously there's sugar in vitamin water unless you drink vitamin water zero. But the reason we're discussing this is because CBS actually did a report this week saying that uh, energy drinks and sports drinks are like bathing your teeth in acid. That they actually uh, are really, really bad for your teeth. What you're, what you're drinking. So the reason Iggy's referring to the sugar in vitamin water is because we, uh, we got, we this article came across us this week from CBS News that essentially um, vitamin, the things you think are healthy, energy drinks and sports drinks are somewhat healthy. Although we know they've always had some problems, are actually also really bad for your teeth. True, and soda that I brought up shouldn't surprise anybody. So right, that goes and the thing is. Saying. A lot, you know, they say a lot of people, especially young adults, are switching from soda to these energy drinks because soda's supposed to be bad for your teeth. But, uh, you know, like Iggy said, sometimes the stuff you're drinking that you think is good for you, you know, it's, it's that something like 50% of teens say they're drinking energy drinks and 62% say they drink at least one sports drink per day. Not to mention that these things taste god awful. I think it's an acquired taste. What do you think, Iggy? I'm sorry, I didn't. Well, I, well what I was going to say, yeah, what I was going to say also is what I found interesting in the article is when the company tried to defend themselves, they were talking about, well, it's not like you're going to keep this and gargle with it. You know, these are other words that I'm using, of course, but they're, they were trying to make it that well. You're really not going to really keep it in your mouth for all that long as a defense to the fact that obviously there's still going to be residue from the drink unless you're going to be totally uh, doing a rinse after every drink that's going to remain, that's actually going to be doing the damage after the fact. Yeah, and in the article, this is interesting to me, Iggy, because this is something that people used to tell me to do, you know, like other, like uh, friends of the family or older older people who were keeping me said, well, if you don't have your toothbrush, just chew some sugar-free gum. 
And it says they're actually telling teens, if you're going to drink the sports drink, at least choose some sugar-free gum afterwards to get some of it out of your mouth. You know, I agree with Iggy's theory a thousand percent that you could probably drink as much of this crap and as much soda as you want to, not to mention what you're doing to your stomach. But as far as your mouth is concerned, if you go ahead and gargle almost literally every time you drink soda or a sports drink, you're probably not going to do any damage to your mouth then. But, well, the, but yeah, who's going to gargle afterwards? Well, that's why that's why this doctor, uh, Dr. Jennifer, the dentist, Dr. Jennifer Bone, who's the spokesperson for the Academy of General Dentistry, recommends chewing sugar-free gum. It's basically, she basically says that'll do it. Because obviously you're not going to carry around, I mean, most people don't, some people do, carry around mouthwash. So she said, I'll just chew some sugar-free gum and then rinse your mouth with water. I guess. Which, yeah, I know. It's still pretty, pretty interesting to me. The things you think are healthy are not always so healthy. And I guess concerning news that things that we once thought about our health are not necessarily true, uh, there's a new study out that says that men are less likely to survive breast cancer. So look out, boys. Did we find out what kind of ratio there is? Well, the overall survival rate for women is 83%, and the overall survival rate for men is 74%. Now, uh, you know... But a I've lot less cases. Exactly, exactly. And that's exactly right, uh, Ed, and a big reason for that, there are only 13,000 male cases, and there are 1,444,000 uh -huh. female cases, so that's a huge difference. Sure. But that difference, actually, Ed, you're absolutely right, is a part of the problem, because, you know, for women, there are guidelines for regular screening, clinical screening, uh, in-home tests, you know, on yourself in the shower, mammograms, but they don't tell men to do those things. So women typically are getting diagnosed or in earlier stages, whereas men never would think, hey, we have breast cancer because they're only 1% of the breast cancer sufferers. So as a result, apparently they're dying in, in larger percentages once they're diagnosed. And I guess if anybody wants to hear some more in-depth discussion on this, you just happen to have a place that they could go? That's right. They can come and listen to uh, last week's Crashing Glass podcast. I guess it was this Friday's Crashing Glass podcast, Chicks with Tatas. And uh, it's not just for chicks with tatas. We actually talked to a radiologist uh, about breast cancer discovery, about how to prevention methods, and just different everything to do with breast cancer, pretty much from A to B. It was really extensive. So, yeah, if you're at all curious or interested, go and listen to that podcast. It'll tell you what the lumps will feel like. It'll tell you what your breast, whether you're a man or a woman, should feel like. So, uh, so yeah, feel free to go listen to the Crashing Glass podcast, Chicks with Tatas. And uh, Iggy, anything on that one? No, other than the fact that you brought it up, it's making me think if I actually should go for a mammogram. Not that I'm <laughs> feeling any pain. Yeah, speaking that of that, that, other than uh, like self-examinations or something, are there mammograms or something for men? Well, I mean, you can always talk to a doctor uh, about doing an examination for you. Women have the fortune that we, if you will, the fortune or the curse, that we have to see gynecologists once right. a year, and with your gynecology exam is a breast exam. So for men, obviously, when you go see your regular doctor, you can have them check them out for you, especially if you're doing the self-exam and you find something that just feels weird. You don't want to wait until you until your arm is bumping into it or until you're uncomfortable to go to your doctor because at that point, obviously, you know, like the article says, you're going to be a lot further into the process. So I learned a lot this week on the Crashing Glass yes. podcast. <laughs> so did the rest of us that have already listened to it. And uh, I guess, you know, as speaking of living longer, apparently another thing that uh, both my co-host Jill and I do, joggers are living longer and they're saying possibly happier lives now. This is from a study out of Dublin. Those who jog at least an hour a week uh, have, uh, on average, about six more years of life. Iggy, hey, are you a jogger? No, actually, I'm just actually someone that will get on a treadmill. I used to run many, many years ago, but I actually... Yeah, there uh, you go. That's right. Tell the truth there, Iggy. You were a, a track and field kind of person. Yes, I ran track. I ran cross country competitively. I did rather well at it. I was uh, certainly a multi-letter athlete doing it, so I did perform at a pretty good level. We had excellent teams. The ironic thing about the whole thing was we were a group two school, basically in Garfield, competing against a lot of the powerhouses, like the Hackensacks, the Cliftons, with, which Ed, you being originally from Elwood Park, would certainly be familiar with the size of those towns and the size of those high schools. And oh, they all had big sports, sports programs. programs and yeah. being able to more than hold our own as far as competing with them 
I believe because they've actually changed the dynamics for the track team and everything. I still think I'm still in the record book, fortunately, for my side. Usually records are always broken on the mile relay team as far as uh, when we actually ran in states. Uh, and that goes back to uh, 1975, which was the year I also graduated my senior year. We also had a dynamite track team and certainly an excellent mile relay team. And I got to run one of the legs on so, the mile relay. But so getting after, back to the question, the way I feel is regardless of how long I live or don't live, the happiness factor, I'm much happier not running. Well, you know, physiologically and statistically, that's actually not true because when you run, you release the serotonin that actually makes you happier. Uh, there's that's nothing true. about running that makes me happy, believe me. <laughs> a, a lot of, it also has something to do with the immediate death rate. They said they monitored 35 years of follow-up with the, they did this with uh, over 19,000 participants. And there were only 112, let me see here, there were only 122 deaths among the joggers versus 10,158 deaths among the non-joggers. So that's a big difference. So not only in can you add six years to your life, but even in the immediate term of these people who were anywhere from, I think, 20 to 79. So you could be living longer, Ed, but it, but apparently for you, you said not that happy. <laughs> Lobster, were you ever a runner? I saw you walk on a treadmill once, Lair. Yeah, oh, yeah. We have pictures oh, yeah. of it, too. We could prove it. I, I seem to remember yeah. a cookie in his hand, but... Yeah, was there was treadmill. a cookie. Actually, it was a bag of cookies. But were you ever a runner? I think I tried it once and gave up on it. <laughs> kind of like my running career, yeah. Actually, I've heard that walking is better for you than jogging. It's easier on your feet. Well, where your th this particular study says that overall for your health, for your lifespan, running is actually better. But there are certain people whose joints are just not made for running. You know, we, we on actually <laughs> since we were talking about crashing glass on our podcast, Run Chicks Run, we actually uh, discussed that with a physical therapist. And you're right, Larry. For some people, for their joints, walking is actually better for them. But they do well, say that your overall lifespan will increase. For I'll give you a very Cost good example. Cost versus benefit. Do you want to be okay, well, able to walk well, during I'll, those last six years? Okay, I'll give you a very good example. My brother, who used to get out jogging every chance he got about maybe one, maybe two years ago, and it may be could have just been from other reasons or it might have been from the jogging on the hard pavement he had a hip transplant oh yeah hip replacements are actually very well, common I meant, I meant hip replacement yeah hip replacements are actually very common among all kinds of people people who danced in their earlier life cyclists lots of people have to get hip replacements and actually it's one of the most effective surgeries they can do much more effective than shoulder or knee in this day and age, the recovery rate's amazing. And I don't know about your brother, but most people who do even the moderate levels of rehab gain full range of motion within something like a year, just six months. And one, and one time when we all got together, my brother said to me, how are your hips? And I says, oh, they're fine because I mostly do more walking than actual <laughs> jogging, the, you know, pounding on the hard pavement. We're going to send him the video of you on the treadmill, Larry. <laughs> No, that should be I, that should be good, good for a high entertainment value. Oh, it is. No, I don't. I don't think he needs to see that. <laughs> Besides, well, oh, his, go ahead. His, sorry, says, his email address is available on a need-to-know basis. <laughs> Well, something that'll they'll make both the runners and the non-runners on this podcast quite happy. Reebok, actually, a very prominent running shoe company, is doing something really nice for the nation's tallest man. His name is Igor Vavkovsky. I hope I'm saying that right. He lives up in Massachusetts by you guys. There with you, Ed. And he's in Canton. And uh, Reebok actually invited him in. They took pressurized molds of his feet and they custom made him shoes because he's had to have all these surgeries for his feet. And every time he tried to put them in a regular pair of shoes, he just, you know, they just tore his feet apart. And because he has never, he only has owned like one pair of shoes that fit. He was constantly having trouble. He was slipping, he was falling, and he, he couldn't even go for a walk. And so now they've gotten him a really interesting shoe. They took these three-dimensional uh, pressure points to feet, and uh, now the, the nation's tallest man can walk around unhindered. That's really nice that Reebok did that for him, and it surprises me that more companies over the years of this man's life haven't 
offered something like that because even whatever amount of research and development or you know measurements of his feet and everything and all the scientific stuff behind it to develop just the proper pair of shoes or sneakers or running shoes for him it's still nothing you know what's the cost of that and I, I just find it hard to believe, you know, if, if if I had a shoe company and I heard a story about the world's tallest man having a problem finding properly fitting shoes, I certainly would have donated this guy several pairs of shoes. What's the big deal? Well, he uh, it took him a long time to actually sort of get his story out there. Apparently, he's been in surgery. He had surgeries over the course of yeah, the last well, six years. Nobody knew him about efforts. him. Nobody knew about him. Exactly. And now Reebok says the shoes cost twelve to $20,000 to build. And when he finally put this out on social media uh, to try to buy shoes for his life going forward, um, he was trying to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars. And he said, well, I, I figured it would take well over a year. And apparently once social media got a whiff of what was happening to him and what he wanted to do, because he was cleared to walk, but he didn't even have shoes that made it safe for him to walk outside. But once social media got wind of this, they raised the money for him overnight. Pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, actually, no, it was, yeah, I'm sorry, that was for the $16,000 to pay for a new uh -huh. custom fit pair. So, And that was overnight, $16,000 right overnight. And he said he wants to start a campaign to set up a shoe fund for life so that he can start applying for jobs and go out of the house. And he said he's just been really amazed by people's generosity. thought that was pretty cool. He says he's just trying to make his life as normal as possible. Good for him. Yeah. And good for Reebok. It's some DNA, make a guy the tallest man. That's pretty crazy. Was he like I'm seven nine? He didn't actually tell me how tall he is. Seven Wonder nine, right? Seven ten. Oh, seven ten. There you go. Yeah, that's really tall. Well, I guess DNA can do a lot of other things too. This week, it actually cleared a man in prison for eighteen years for a crime he didn't commit. Did you read this one, Eggy? Oh yes, I did actually. So tell and me a little bit about this guy. Do you have you heard about this murder? Well, I didn't really research the murder. I remember looking over the article and. What struck me about the article more than anything else, there's always been pros and cons in regards to the death penalty. And I guess something like this would be uh, against the death penalty, especially when someone is actually innocent of a crime he's been convicted of. Uh, what I really found is it's more than anything else what the article struck, which is a common tone, I think, in these sort of cases, is the overzealous prosecutor who, in a way, because of the pressure, I guess, from the public or the community that we have to certainly have justice and find someone guilty so then we can charge them with the crime and then people feel in that manner that justice actually has been done. I think this pretty much would fit that sort of story where, you know, basically they needed to charge someone with the crime and then at that point, uh, once they did charge someone with the crime, thank God for DNA nowadays, they basically thought that the case was closed and this person spent 18 years of his life basically suffering for a crime he never committed. I, I think it's amazing what DNA evidence has been able to do. And they say that the man who actually they believe committed this murder that they had the semen tied to is the same man who killed Susan Dahl, uh, which I don't know if any of you guys were following these kinds of stories at the time. But these were both of these women were strangled, Susan Dahl with telephone cord and the woman Taylor that's spoken about in this in this story with a leash. And uh, and then he raped and, and beat both of them. And the man who actually did it was a guy by the name of Thames, his last name's Thames, uh, Douglas Thames. And he was convicted for Susan Dahl. And now, of course, they're able to match this stain to him. Whereas in the time that uh, Dewey was convicted, they weren't able to match it. And I think it's just amazing that the evidence, this is what's amazing to me about the new technologies that we have. And this is what gets me every week on the show when we do the technology segment is the things that we're going to be able to do in the future that we couldn't do even 10 years ago. This has been 18 years ago, but the fact that all that evidence was there, I mean, he felt comfortable. Now, nowadays, no rapist would feel comfortable leaving his DNA at a scene, at a crime scene. But back then, there was no way for them to do anything about that. Just sad that the guy lost 18 years of his life. It really is. Everybody, all of the talk of the, the wardens and the people who took care of him, they say they're really worried about him coming out of prison because he is. He seems to be a very even keel guy, a very nice guy, a very rational guy, and they just they just think it's so sad that he's been away from society for 18 years because that causes problems for people in and of itself. 
So here's a man who knows he wasn't guilty, and now he's been in prison and adjusted to life in prison for 18 years, and now he has to readjust to being on the outside. I, I think you're absolutely right. It's really sad that he lost 18 years of his life because that it will change the rest of his life, hopefully for the better, but you never know. You know, going to prison is such an, a polarizing situation for, for these convicts or for, you know, for people like this guy who are innocent and convicted anyway. Pretty intense. And I guess I would love to lighten the mood a little bit if you want to talk to us a little bit about Titanic again, Ed. Oh, Titanic 2. We've talked about this specifically on our Titanic episode a couple of weeks back on its 100th anniversary of the sinking. Over the course of a number of years now, there's been several different firms that have said they wanted to build a replica of Titanic that, of course, would be up to modern-day standards and everything, those safety standards. And a company is finally doing it. And I guess within the next, I think, in two years, I think 2014 or something, it's supposed to go on its maiden voyage. And naturally, it's going to also go on the route that the, Titan the original Titanic was taking 100 years ago. 2016, I think, is going to be the year. Okay. And uh, I, I just think it's pretty cool. And I've said all along that I would be one of the first to sign up if I could afford it. You know, who knows? This is going to be a regular thing, apparently, if... Uh, uh, let's assume that this ship makes it through its maiden voyage. It'll be a regular seagoing venture here back and forth. And if it was affordable, I would certainly like to do it. They say that it's going to be designed appearance-wise identical to the original Titanic. So when you're on board this ship, you're going to feel just like people did on the original ship, which is just awesome. I hope I can get at least see it if I don't get the sail on it. It would be just so incredible to just go on a tour of this thing, even if I never went across the ocean on it. But, you know, we'll see what happens. I, I think it's it's a great idea. It, it is going to be up to all of the modern specs. Uh, funny, ironically, one of the builders or engineers or something on the project. Naturally, the press was all over it saying, so now, no pun intended, this is going to be an unsinkable ship, or what are you trying to build here? And the engineer or the builder, whoever it was, said, look, let me tell you, he says, no ship is unsinkable. He says, but we're going to build it up to the most current, up-to-date modern standards and basically hope for the best. That's really positive that powers that be behind this ship aren't claiming that this Titanic is going to be unsinkable or anything. He says, you know, you never say never. Stuff happens. Ed, so, Ed, what do you think about the the rumor that this ship is going to be built in China, being an avid Titanic fan? Well, it would have been great if it could have been built in either Ireland or England, like the original Titanic. I personally don't have a problem with it being built in China, as long as it's not an American company that's outsourcing like this country is known to do to China to have it built. If this is a company that's building it that's based already in Europe or something, I don't particularly have a problem. I have a problem with the United States outsourcing work to China, but what Europe does is what Europe does, so uh, I don't have the, a problem. With the, guy, the guy in charge of this is Clive Palmer, and he is a billionaire from Australia. Okay. Uh, he's the fifth ris richest person in Australia, and he's a coal magnate. And uh, basically, he chose to commission a CSC Jingling Shipyard to build the ship, and they're doing it in the shipyard there in China. And I guess one of the things I think would be positive about this is if they do build it in China and then sail it to the UK, at least it will have a proven voyage before you put people on it. Yep, that would be quite of a test run ahead of time. Yeah, I think, I mean, if it does end up, if it ends up going through and working that way. Uh, Palmer hasn't really provided any details on how much this is going to cost or anything like that. So he actually established his own new shipping company designed to work for the Titanic 2 and has started working with a historical research team to try to make sure that he's making all the right decisions. And even though it'll have all the same uh, it'll have the same smokestacks and all of that. Uh, he said it'll have it'll be the decoration to look like the hull, but they're not going right. to make it coal powered like the original. They're going to do everything really modern, like right. you mentioned. So I think that's interesting. No, I just think it's so cool. And if, it, if it's affordable, I'd certainly like to go on a cruise on it. If not, hopefully, when it gets to Boston, New York, somewhere on the east coast of the United States, hopefully they at least offer some kind of tours of it or something. Because boy, I'd certainly go on a tour. Yeah, that's pretty cool. 
So uh, I guess we'll talk a little bit about turning gears a little bit, speaking of billionaires. <laughs> Target and uh, Amazon are apparently always, they have always worked together. And recently Target has made an announcement that they are kicking Amazon out of their stores. They're going to remove all the Kindle products from their shelves. Everything that's Amazon branded as hardware because of a new alliance with Apple. Money, uh, money, you know, money. Yeah, ex money, 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 money. So... I guess the internet says it's a conflict of interest or, you know, app, but Apple just, I don't know. We talked about, you know, I said that I think Apple's basically becoming a patent troll. And I think this is just dirty business. I mean, I, I, I get it. You're providing an Apple store and Target's store, and hopefully this will get more people into the store. But Target and Amazon have actually gone through the same online platform. You can use your Amazon password to sign into Target. I'm a person who has done that out of convenience for years. And now, all of a sudden, after this, I mean, their relationship with Amazon has got to be over 20 years old, because I've been doing that since I was on the Internet. And now, all of a sudden, they say, well, nah, we're just going to go with Apple. Well, there's a thing called the business decision. The, the low-end Kindle, the one that offers advertising on it to give it a, a lower rate, is only $79. The iPads start at $499, and you know that Target is being paid more or less on a commission basis by the products that they have warehoused in their store. Well, I'd rather take the commission on a $499 iPad than on a $79 Kindle. Well, and of course, you know, Target's even saying what I think even makes it a little more, I understand the decision of it, but what even makes it a little more sort of dirty in my mind is that they're getting rid of all the Kindle products and all that, the Amazon hardware, but they're still going to carry things like cases for the Kindle because they figure people will come in to buy, to look at the Apple products and to go to the store, but they'll pick up little inexpensive things while they're there. So even if they can't buy or afford an Apple product, they'll spend lots of money on cheap extras. So it's sort of like they're screwing Amazon to get more money from Amazon. Yeah. Well, you know, also there's no more such thing as loyalty either, whether it's in business, sports, or anything. No, it's true. And I, I think Amazon shoppers are loyal to Amazon. But what I think oh, is absolutely. really nasty about Apple is Amazon carried Apple products. I just think it's kind of nasty that... Apple would take the idea that just because Amazon wanted to enter into this market, and that was the logical next step for the Kindle, an e-reader, you know, one of the, the, art, the article actually suggests that e-readers are sort of a thing of the past, and we know that, that we're moving past e-readers alone, that if you're going to have an e-reader, it has to do something else. And I believe that what Amazon did was not a direct hit at Apple. It was actually an attempt to adapt the Kindle so that they wouldn't lose that business, so they keep forward with the way people are going to be reading because Amazon is – you know, at its very heart, a company for people who like to read. That's where it started, was selling books and then just blew up into this whole online marketplace. I believe they were just trying to evolve. I believe that what Apple's doing is actually a, a targeted effort, and I think it's pretty despicable. Oh, Apple just wants to own the world. Of course. I mean, if you could, wouldn't you, I guess. I'm actually going to go on Amazon right now and see if I can find an iPad. Now, now, uh, sorry, Iggy, where do you fall on this issue? Are you are well, you a fan? Well, uh, well, actually, one of the things that's interesting you you mentioned about the ticket price as it would pertain to Apple. Apple is well known, and part of the reason why they've been very profitable to their stockholders is the fact that Apple, because of the uniqueness of their product and them always being cutting edge in anything they do. They've been able to basically take their technology and sell it for more than competitors. So obviously the margins are larger, which obviously is going to produce a better profit margin and center for Target as well. The fact that you know Apple sells at a higher profit margin, it goes right down wherever their products are sold. Well, but what's really unfair about this is, I mean, you know, Amazon has an Apple store on Amazon. So whereas Apple wants to play on Amazon's platform, it's not willing to play with Amazon in Target. That's what I think is, that's why I think this is so despicable. I wouldn't think if, if, if Apple, and Apple has at certain times, although they did have legislation passed against them for doing it, as did Microsoft, as Ed mentioned in the early 80s, you know, they, they both tried to own the market at one time or another, and people demand a free platform environment. And I feel that doing things like this really just slows the progress. And also the big loser here is going to be Target, because retail stores are going down, are going, are getting smaller amounts of business now anyway. 
you which know, was going to be my next point. I just wonder what the numbers are going to be like for this. Not to knock Target, because as a matter of fact, I just happened to have been at a Target a week ago yesterday. And I do love Target. Me too. But what are the numbers going to be like? Just how many either Kindles or iPads are going to be either have been or will be sold at a Target anyway? You just said for yourself that these brick and mortar stores are going out. One of the best buys in the Boston area is just uh, closing up shop now. They announced 50 of them nationwide or something. And one out of the three or four that happened to be in the Boston area was their lowest grossing store. So it's getting banged up, the one in the back bay of Boston. So these brick and mortar stores, even your best buys, are going the way of the dinosaur. So I guess that's what makes me just wonder just how significant this really is anyway. Honestly, how much longer is Target going to be around, or at least Target in the electronics type industries. Target might be around for years and years yet selling men and women's clothing, but I don't know that they're going to ultimately be in the electronics business. Well, and I think also what upsets me about it is Target has positioned themselves as being a really quality discount retailer. And if Target is going to be economically feasible, and they're already more expensive than some of their competitors, and I think other people are making a play for the market because Target has sort of almost priced themselves out of the market. They're overall nicer stores, though. You get what you pay for, or you pay what you say, pay for what you're saying as well. well. It's true, but I mean, you know, Target is the Lord and Taylor or something of the discount stores. Right. They're exactly. nice looking stores. Well, but look at what happened to Lord and Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, I'm just saying if you're a discount store, and I love the setup of Target, but it's been to where when I've gone in there recently, things are not cheap enough for me to want to buy Target quality clothes at that price. I'd rather go someplace else, even a JCPenney or someplace, you know, like that, which I never thought I'd say. I really thought JCPenney was breathing its last breath a few years ago. But I think eventually you start to see the writing on the wall, and Target has priced themselves out of their Target market, if you will. So I, I don't know. I mean, I think this was, I don't know what this move exactly was intended to do on either party's part. I see where it's coming from, where Apple's concerned. Just but, a business uh, decision. I think, but don't read more or less into it. It was a business decision ultimately. Uh, well, the bottom but line. I, as a business person, I, I wonder, I wonder if they thought, I, I always wonder who they talked to and if they thought through all of the ramifications because there are ramifications that are financial that come from all of this other stuff that I'm talking about. And there, and it's been proven time and time again in the history of business that this sort of stuff has ramifications on the back end. And especially when you, when you look at who your target consumer is, if you make that target consumer unhappy, you lose, you ultimately lose all your business. Well, I think that, well to, I think a, to agree to disagree with you, I'll just have to say <laughs> that Obviously, Apple really made a sweetheart deal here to Target, and Target couldn't pass it by. That must be that. That must be how they felt about it. <laughs> I don't know if I feel the same way. Although I, I'm with Iggy, I love I love the products, but I do not like what they've been doing in the market recently. I, I and I don't feel that they're that they're producing the products to back up their actions anymore. I think they've slowed a little bit on innovation, and I think it's costing them in the marketplace. 4G is just the start of that. So anyway, I guess I guess that's my that's my thought. <laughs> so if you're if you and if you don't have do you have anything else you want to say on that one? Oh no, I'm done. All right. Uh, so would you would you actually walk us through? Apparently, you know, we talked about Natalie Wood had the whole the whole Natalie Wood's death resurgence that happened a few months ago. Sort of brought her and Robert Wagner's relationship back into the news, and now their daughter is in the news. She was arrested a couple of days ago for alleged heroin and cocaine possession. The story is still too new to follow up on, really, at this point, because it's only a couple of days old. But that's the bottom line. Uh, alleg uh, not allegedly arrested. Arrested for allegedly possessing heroin and cocaine. So... Well, and an interesting part of the story is apparently the police arrived at uh, at the residence where she was. It was actually at her home. there was a gun involved or something? Yep. Yeah, a guy was there, an unidentified male. They're calling him unidentified, uh, negligently discharged a uh, Sounds a like gun. a drug deal going bad. Yeah, that sounds like a mess. We will definitely keep an eye on it, and I'm sure Fred will keep an eye on it, because he's always kept an eye on the Natalie Wood-ish stories. He's a fan, huh? I guess we could say that. 
<laughs> well, speaking of a fan, as we have talked about multiple times on the show, I'm a fan of many fandoms. Pretty much anything Joss Whedon touches, I'm a huge fan of, and obviously I am a diligent Harry Potter fan. Who and cares? My- collided thank you fred will be so happy to do that and my fandoms collided in a massive story well not so massive unless you consider it financially the avengers beat the opening weekend record held by deathly hallows part two they the avengers made 200 million dollars on opening weekend harry potter and the deathly hallows part part two made 169 did you guys see the avengers this weekend I didn't. Oh, my gosh. Are you kidding me? I swear. Sometimes I think you guys just live under rocks up there in the Northeast. I don't bother do. watching movies. But I did. We've talked about for other movies in the past. I have had the opportunity to watch most of it. And it looks good. It uh, It's amazing, actually. It's really, really good. And the big deal about the Avengers is, those of you who are familiar with Joss Whedon, Joss Whedon, of course, was the mastermind behind Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He wrote the movie, uh, but then didn't direct it because he had some uh, issues with the people involved. Then he actually wrote and directed and basically produced uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer on TV. And uh, Angel was one of his, fire, the cult fandom, Firefly and Serenity are his. He also did Dr. Horribles, which the online community, obviously, it's a huge deal for us because it was the first time a really well-produced, uh, something somebody from the television world really made that crossover. And, of course, that brought Neil Patrick Harris's career back in a big way, along with the uh, Harold and Kumar movies. So Joss Whedon has always been a huge force in Hollywood. He's a script doctor for a lot of these uh, movies. And finally, and Robert Downey Jr. likes to say that this is because of him. I don't know if he actually made the, the connection, but they hired Joss Whedon to do the Avengers, and he has a huge history with Marvel. He's script doctored a lot of the movies. He's written comic books for Marvel, so he's very familiar with the plot lines of all these characters. Plus, he tends to treat his films with a certain level of comedy, the way he writes the natural comedy of a team interaction, the way he handles a very strong cast of characters. I mean, you know, every star on the planet was in this movie. (laughs) Oh, not everyone, but quite a few. Scarlett Johansson, Robert Downey Jr., Mark Ruffalo, Jeremy Renner, Chris Evans, everybody who's been in the actual individual Avengers movies. And so I, I really would like to say I think that this is because of Joss Whedon's involvement. And I think anybody in his fandom would probably agree with that. Well, and it does look good in the box office to start. Certainly, certainly proving that it's good. You know what I am looking forward to? And What's that? certain people will be surprised to hear this. The Dark Knight, I've been showing the trailer for it for several weeks now. I have not been a fan of the Batman series. The Dark Knight, I'll, I'll digress here. The Dark Knight is the final movie in this trilogy or whatever it turned out to be, this current Batman series. I have not been a fan of the Batman movies since the original movie with Michael Keaton as Batman, uh, who some people till this day say was the best Batman. But however, from watching the trailer, this Dark Knight just looks so good to me. I'm actually enthusiastically awaiting its arrival and think it's late July. Now, Ed, are you a fan of the uh, comic books, the Batman comic books? or any No, I'm not a comic book fan, but I was a fan of the original 60s Batman TV show. And then the very first Batman movie, when it became a movie, because uh, when Michael Keaton was in it, I agree with those people that say he was probably the best Batman ever. I really enjoyed that. And then when it moved on from there, I lost all interest in it till this point. I I think it'll be interesting. Uh, A lot of fans are skeptical of the treatment of Bane because of the way he's written versus the way he is in the comic books. And I'm interested to see how that relationship flushes out. I don't dislike Tom Hardy, but I have some doubts as to if he can pull off that character really convincingly. So that's. See, I I can't make those comparisons, so I don't. That doesn't interest me, you know, as to whether it relates to the character directly or not. Well, I think a lot of it will have to do just, it's, it's more about is he going to be effective on film? You know, not not necessarily if people can compare or contrast, but is that character going to come across with the appropriate level of gravity the way that they've created it mm-hmm. for, the, for the viewing audience? Not necessarily people who've read it, but just anyone who sees it. Are they going to be afraid enough of this guy? So I think I think that'll be interesting. That's a really good one to bring up, Ed. We'll have to, we'll have, to have some more who cares news about that. 
And uh, moving uh, from one creative story or fandom into another, I have to say I'm on this show with, uh, you know, we try to represent all kinds of generations and people who are into different things. And I grew up in the era in which the Beastie Boys were dominating the music scene. I mean, they changed so much about hip hop and rock and roll and became one of the most influential forces in music. And actually a big part of that was Adam Yach, who's, who actually directed under, under an acronym under, a, oh, what's it called when you direct under something that's not your real name? Help me out, guys. A pseudonym? 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 Yes, I think that's right. And he, he called himself Nathaniel Hawthorne, and he was uh, he directed actually the, the newer movie that got real critical acclaim in the last year called uh, We Need to Talk About Kevin. So not only was he a part of the movement that was the BC Boys as um, MCA is what he was called, he then went on to become a really groundbreaking director. So he has died. He's from Brooklyn, and uh, he died of cancer. They're being very inspecific as to what kind. But that is, I mean, every news story from NPR to Fast Company basically has uh, precluded the kind of cancer, and I wonder if that was a strategic choice on some level. He was only 47 years old, which really brought it home for me. So that's uh, that's our entertainment hobbit this week, you know, RIP, MCA. And I guess I'll turn it over to Larry, actually, for our sports-related obit this week. This past Wednesday morning, the 2nd of May, Junior Seiya was found in the bedroom of his Oceanside, California home by his girlfriend with a gunshot wound to the chest. He had spent 20 years in the NFL, the San Diego Chargers, Miami Dolphins, and he finished up his career with the New England Patriots, and he was a true professional when it came to the game of football. He didn't play dirty like most of the members of the NFL do now, which is good. And whenever he would enter the locker room before a game, he would always say to everyone on the different teams, hey, buddy, as I said, he was a true professional and he will be missed. And he spent three years with the Patriots at the end of his career, I believe, correct? Actually, it was it was four, four years, mm-hmm. four years with the Patriots, 13 years with the Chargers and three years with the Dolphins. Now, Larry, do you believe the hype that the 1994 Chargers are cursed because of all the deaths that have occurred within the team? Boy, sure is. What, six or something? Uh, it looks like, I believe it was 13 in this oh, article that I read. Wow. Let, me, let me check my facts before I go with that. Just unbelievable. Champions, uh, eight, eight actually, at meet you in the middle. There were eight dead players uh, from that team. Uh, all of them never reached 45 years of age. Well, and that, whether I believe in curses or not is besides the point, but it sure sounds like a curse. Um, I don't know. They could just, the sports reporters, you know, they could just be hyping this, you know, because to them it's news. Or what about all of the reports that are coming out now, just since Junior's death, about uh, all of these brain injuries and all? on how football is such a violent sport and nothing you could do about it, it's just the nature of the beast. But that's ultimately what's pushing these people over the edge, the ones that actually do commit suicide, putting aside the people that are hurt, in air quotes, permanently from brain injuries, but players that are pushed over the edge, mental-wise, brutal game. You know, I guess you could only get hit on the head so many times. But it doesn't really have to be as brutal as it looks to be. I mean, you know, right, there, are... there has been the scandals about coaches actually paying, giving players bonuses for like like, 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 like the Saints. Yep. Yeah. And and I just and I just read recently that several of the members of the Saints are going to appeal through the NFLPA. Because well, they, they, could, f- they could appeal all they want to appeal. Because they feel, well, there's one member. There's well, I believe it might be Jonathan Vilma from the New Orleans Saints who feels that the NFL commissioner does not have the authority to crack down on this. And he's wrong, and the commissioner is right. Yeah, I'll agree with you on that, Larry, and I'll go even on a step further. I don't have anything against the New Orleans Saints. I fell behind them a few years ago when they won their Super Bowl, just like everybody else in this country. If they did indeed give out bounties, pay the bounties and all to injure other players, there was also some talk since this controversy broke that initially there was going to be a movement within the NFL to go to the commissioner and try to get the franchise license pulled. 
and try to put the New Orleans Saints out of business because of this. That there were a big handful of people that felt strongly enough about this. And you know what? I'm in that camp. I think that if somehow this could be proved that from management, ownership or management of the team, down to players, we're all in collusion here with this bounty format to injure other players in opposing teams, I think that the franchise should be pulled and the team should just be put out of business. That's how you make a statement. Well, a lot, I, I agree with that, Ed, and I think that's actually a much better way to handle this. But I, but the interesting thing is, you know, a lot of people are speculating that the reason that Sal killed himself the way he did through the the, the, gun, the, the gun th- shot through the chest is because David Russell Durerson uh, did the exact same thing. He did thing the same in thing, right? 2011, and before he did it, he sent a text message to his family saying that he was shooting himself in the chest because he wanted his brain to be used for research uh, into the chromatic, they call it a chronic traumatic, and here it is again, I've had to say this twice I think today, encephalopathy, uh, which is caused by playing pro football, so the, the brain injury that they're talking about. And I, I take issue somewhat with this whole situation because it seems that the, that the players are willing to injure one another permanently for a few dollars, but then they want the league to protect them from this, from each other, and it just seems that this is a cycle that could stop and end with them. Yeah, if they, right. if it, I'm sorry, go ahead, Larry. I was just going to say, well, there is there's one member of an NFL team who, you know, and I've seen several interviews with him, and he has said, this is how I play, and I will never change the way I play. He deliberately goes for the helmet-to-helmet hits. Well, and I think it's interesting, too, because you think about rugby players play without helmets. You think boxers, they know what they're getting into when they go into their sport. And I really feel like there are, there's either the answer that Ed was talking about, where you actually put regulation on this and you don't allow it to happen at all, and you regulate so hard and so fast against it, and you make it a just un, un, a call that you can't come back from, or you let it ride and nobody gets to complain and it's in their contract at the beginning. Hey, you may ruin your brain. Ironically, you brought up the sport of boxing. I was always a huge, huge fan of professional boxing in all weight classes. Every chance I would get on television, I'd be watching it. And so I was this huge boxing fan. Somewhere along the line, and I, I don't know what made the light bulb go off in my head, I just said, you know, this is such a brutal sport. It's just two guys or two women in a ring knocking the hell out of each other, causing brain injuries to each other, and I really just don't need to watch this anymore. And, you know, it's it's several years now since I've come to that recollection, and I don't think I've watched one boxing bout in several years now since the light bulb went on, and I just said this is just such a brutal sport that's got no purpose to it. You know, to have two people just go into a ring and knock the hell out of each other, I don't see a purpose behind it anymore. Well, and I, I think that's I think that's a part of the choice of the fans of the sport, too. It's a choice that they have to make. What kind of football do you want to see, and what are you willing to, what kind of legislation within the league are you willing to support to see the kind of football you want to see? Sure. Turn it into flag football. <laughs> I don't want to see flag football. Maybe I'm a part of the problem. <laughs> well, before we wrap things up, uh, our obit segment there kind of segued, but we stayed on topic anyway, and it needed to be discussed. Before we wrap up this week's show, Iggy, Lauren Signasic, why don't you tell our listeners about what you and our announcer Gene White who is now going to co-host something with you tell us about your project that's upcoming forthcoming a little bit of what it's going to be about and I will just spill the beans here saying that BaseNet will be introducing a new audio podcast over the next couple weeks that is a religious based podcast called Faith Talk so Iggy, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about Faith Talk, where you're looking to go with the podcast, both yourself and Gene, a little about yourself, so on and so forth. Yes, uh, thanks for uh, the kind introduction, Ed. Uh, basically, Faith Talk is going to be a podcast that's going to be evolving. It's going to actually have anything from human interest stories that are going to be about people that have been moved by 
their intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be something that people are going to find very hopefully uplifting and motivating to themselves. And what I mean by that is that just as my own personal relationship was changed forever once I made a commitment to the Lord, there are many stories that certainly a lot of people have had their lives profoundly influenced by either a particular circumstance, a certain turning point that has actually taken place, a uh, leap in faith, uh, something that they were actually having their faith actually stretched to the extreme where they saw no way out or they had lost hope and then something or the light went on or they were moved by a certain experience or a certain commitment that they had made to someone else whatever, all these interwoven stories of faith are going to be something that I'm going to be bringing on a weekly basis. It's going to be something a little bit different from what everybody else does because everybody else normally will fall into talking about a particular subject in the Bible or something that would be specifically contemporary to what's going on. I'm going to try to mix it up a little bit. I'm going to be bringing in special guests from time to time that are actually going to share their stories of faith. Other times, it's going to be something that's actually going on currently in, say, in 2012 that might have a direct effect on a large group of people regarding uh, certain challenges that everyone faces in their everyday life. So it's going to be something that's going to be entirely all mixed in, but everything is going to have that one common denominator, and it's going to be how faith was actually going back an extraordinary change in their life, how they got to uh, basically start to deal with their challenges through actually addressing some of the issues in their life, how faith was a very important component of actually turning their life around and actually how it actually pertains to their everyday life and walk in the Lord Jesus today. And that's actually going to be pretty much the entire part of the program. It's going to be something that's going to keep things never being too regimented in a way where it's always going to be one thing. It's going to be something where people could always look forward to something fresh, something new, something different from what they would actually draw as far as uh, lessons as well as resources for faith, which they could find in other venues. So it's trying to be totally different, maybe a little bit out of the box, but at the same time, something that's going to really allow and really address a large group of various types of people into actually having that walk of faith and changing their life in a profound way. Great. We really look forward to it. And so that's Faith Talk coming up within the next couple of weeks. Gene and Larry will be recording their first show very shortly. And we'll get that online for everybody. As part of our expanded BaseNet TV programming, Faith Talk will be the next in our successive line of podcasts, audio podcasts here for everybody to listen to and we are also expanding our video line and bringing our video programming back hence the name basenet tv so we can't just be all audio podcasts we are doing more and more with our about los angeles show another episode just went online tonight from its host julie marie out in los angeles and jill henley holly's co-host on crashing glass is also the host of About Boston, and she's got a few things coming up locally in the Boston area. And in our flagship show, of which Holly was a former host of After Dark, we're bringing that back with Allison Lee as the host now. And all of our correspondents, including Holly, will be contributing to the new and improved After Dark, which will be a news magazine show as it was way back in its heyday almost five years ago. So ironically, as it's coming up on its fifth anniversary, we're bringing it back hopefully better than ever. So watch for all of BaseNet TV's expanded programming and its new lineup coming shortly. Follow us on social media at BaseNet TV. All social media sites are now BaseNet TV. Facebook, we no longer have a profile page. We are just using fan pages now. So feel free to like us at BaseNet TV on Facebook and also on Twitter and Google Plus as BaseNet TV. And while we're giving out individual plugs, the Crashing Glass podcast is also available on Twitter. So you could talk to Holly and Jill directly at Crashing Glass on Twitter. Can and should. <laughs> <laughs> And I guess that's about it. If you want to email any comments or suggestions about this show, you could write to awsi 
at basenettv.com. For any sponsorship or advertising ideas you may have, if you want to become an advertiser or sponsor of Basenet Television, marketing at basenetintermedia.com. And I guess that just about does it. We certainly missed Fred and Jean today, but they will be back a week from now. For show number 41 of As We See It from Boston, Massachusetts, I'm Ed Jupin. Wow, I'm never second. Um, from, <laughs> from St. Louis, Missouri, I'm Holly Hurley. From Bergen County, New Jersey, I'm Iggy. And from Brooklyn, Massachusetts, I'm the Lobster. We'll see you guys next week. 